I think we're all going to introduce it ourselves one by one. So I'll just give a brief sort of like, what we'll do is we'll go through our work um, briefly and then we'll just sort of talk about it afterwards. <laughs> um, now, as I'm saying it now to a room full of, a virtual room full of people, it sounds very unplanned. And when in the months leading up to this, it felt much more planned than this. Um, but we uh, will start with Peony. So if I click that, then your name will come up and you just uh, let me know when you want to change slide. Beautiful, will do. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Gareth. Thank you everybody for turning up. This is very nice and it's weird how it feels like I am in a room full of many, many people instead of just a friend's house. Um, but anyway, so yeah, thank you all so much for turning up. Um, I'm Peony Jen and I'm a comics maker and illustrator based in London. So if you want to go to the first slide, please, Gareth. Thank you. So for my little introduction, I've kind of put together a bit of a journey, I guess, through my comics practice and kind of why I make comics and yeah, the journey that it's slowly going through. So um, I've started out with this image, which is from a book called For Sarah, which is one that I actually made a couple years ago. And that's because this comic for me really sums up kind of why I make comics and what is the core of what kind of keeps bringing me back to them again and again. And, um, and to be honest, for me, that is comics as a form of catharsis. So um, I never really set out to be like a person who makes comics, like I've always really liked them, but they were never something that I was, you know, I had this like great burning urge to do. It was more that for me, I really, really wanted to make comics that, um, make comics that kind of captured a feeling or was me, uh, working through a series of emotions or working through an event in my life um, and I just wanted the, to put them inside an object and kind of get them out of myself in something that somebody else could learn something from so um yeah and so and it just so happened that comics happened to be the best vessel for that so um yeah the first piece that I ever made that was a comic was um it was working through the passing away of a family friend um and ever since then I've made ones about um anxiety I've made them about um yeah events in my life that have happened kind of relationship breakups that kind of thing um because for me yeah the core of the why I make comics is to work through something and to get it out of me into a form that is outside of myself and I can literally close it as a book Cool. Next slide, please, Karen. And so, however, ever since kind of starting to make comics, I have begun to really, uh, I guess, investigate the form a little bit more um, in, yeah, in the form of abstraction. And that's both in form and in format. So um, I began to get really, really interested in the idea of um, how these words and how the images related to each other. So um, what I really like to do and what I really value is making sure that the words and the images are not say, not doing the same thing. So they're doing something completely different, working together to make something that is much better than each one alone. And so for me, abstraction is the perfect, I guess, exploration form for that. Because um, yeah, for me, if, if all I'm doing is something that's figurative, uh, it runs a bit flat and I don't see it as building on anything really. Uh, next slide, please. And then this uh, comic of mine is an example of me playing a little bit more with the format of comics, because I'm not just interested in seeing how abstract visuals can relate to words to make something um, more interesting or more emotive, but I'm also interested in how can I change the format to really push what I'm trying to do or what I'm trying to say. So, for example, this is a comic, and I still think of it as a comic, even though it's actually a fold-out A3 poster that comes with these little risograph postcards um, that have poems on, um, and it's kind of about it's like a love letter to D and D basically um because it's like my parents grew up playing it and for me it was something that was like full of nostalgia and then began to like take on like these this this new charge set of emotions as I began to like play it with my friends as I got older um and so and so this is kind of meant to reflect those like really early like 80s um like D, &D manuals where you'd get like the slipper the cardboard slip case and you'd pull out all these different things and it was like so exciting and so I tried to recreate that excitement with this comic uh, next slide please um yeah and another step along this kind of journey of exploring where I can push comics and what format these can be in other than just like a printed book. Um, yeah, this was something that I made on my MA course that I did at the RCA in London. So that's the Royal College of Art. Um, and I did visual communication. Um, and it was really interesting for me actually to kind of see how 
I could combine this kind of very personal thing that I did, which was these comics I made about myself and for myself, and how I could push them in this kind of quite critical conceptual sphere that I was in for better or for worse. Um, yeah, and so this is what I started to do. I started to make uh, comic books and I, or you know illustration books, visual narratives, but I'd put them into an installation because I was really interested in how you can make a book a space um, and literally walk through a narrative or walk through a book. Next slide, please. Yeah, and so um, so this piece um, is actually it's it's a stairwell, and it was my final piece in um, of my two year master's course, um, and it's got these little postcards which are on these shelves which run up and down the staircase, and then there's this large uh, fabric piece which you can see in the middle, and um, they kind of yeah combine to form a narrative, and to be honest, for me it is a deconstructed comic. Um, the the pages that are on the little shelves, um, they are kind of like memories and they're also bits of words taken from like news articles and stuff. And basically this whole piece is about born privilege and it's about investigating like my own childhood and kind of comparing it to um, like the childhood of the people in the area um, of London that I was in, because unfortunately there'd been a boy of about 14 who'd been stabbed and killed on the road that I lived on. And it kind of got me thinking about like, yeah, that idea of where where you live at different times in your life and um, how that kind of affects yeah affects you in that kind of way. Um, but again, all of my comics, I think it's important to say, I never really want to uh, I never want to instruct. I never want to overtell. So again, that's why abstraction is really important to me because I really value letting people take what they want from a thing. So I don't ever want to preach at somebody. I just kind of want to offer out a series of thoughts or feelings, and people can take that take from that what they want. Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, but then something that I've also begun to develop in my later work is this idea of, yeah, looking outside of myself for once and doing more documentation and comics as documentation. So this more recent thing that I begin to do is make comics which are documentations of conversations with people like strangers, friends. Um, and what I do for this series is that um, I don't kind of set out to look for these conversations, but when they've happened um, uh, and they kind of spark a thing in my brain and I'm like, oh, that was really interesting. I want to write that down. So um, I'll write down what I remember from the conversation, like every line that I remember them saying on my phone. And then I'll use that as a basis for the comic and I won't add anything in. I won't put in my words either. I just will then kind of draw my experience of the conversation in the comic. So, and again, it kind of returns to that idea of like, I don't want to instruct too much. So again, I'm not giving that person's life story. I'm giving my experience of the conversation. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and so this leaves me is to the current day. Um, and so these are some images of an exhibition that I've got up at the moment, and it's in, um, yeah, to shamelessly plug it, it's in uh, St Pancras Square by King's Cross, like right by that little, the German gymnasium and the little birdcage. Um, and I've got a couple comics up in there. Um, and basically I was, yeah, I was really lucky to have an experience to be the illustrator in residence for the House of Illustration in uh, 2019 slash 2020. Um, and this is the exhibition of all of the work done. So for that, I was doing a kind of investigative um, documentary project about King's Cross. Um, yeah, and I made a couple of comics about um, the area around King's Cross. Um, but yeah, so go see that up, and that's up until the 27th of September. Sorry, I definitely spoke for quite a long time there. No, don't worry, it's very interesting. Uh, no. Um, and so next slide is Olivia Sullivan, really bright green screen. Um, <laughs> I'm actually blinded by it. Um, <laughs> Olivia, over to you. Okay, so um, I'm primarily a comic artist, but I also do illustration work and experimental design work. Um, I focus on creating abstract and surreal comics that use limited language and non-sequential panels that are uh, more so poetry rather than conventional prose. Because um, I kind of want to match comics to be what is in like our brain, like our thoughts, and they're never sequential. You're always thinking about the past, the present, the future. Um, so that's what I kind of want to show. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so Escapades is a one-shot comic that I created that was nominated for the Broken Frontier Awards um, in 2020. So it's a surreal dream world that explores identity and discovery in fractured thoughts and conversations. So um, 
I, I wanted to make sure that um, um, it, similar to what Peony um, said that you don't want to overpower the reader you kind of want them to explore and interpret it interpret things in their own way um, next slide please so I enjoy experimenting with visual communication in comics by making some animation tests through GIFs. So I think comics have um, the scope to thrive in all kinds of formats and it just gives a different kind of take to the comic. And um, yeah, so I'd like to play around with moving image. Uh, next slide, please, Gareth. Cool. Um, so Delayed Sunday is a short Riso comic that I was commissioned for the El Cafe this year. Um, it's a snippet of my experience of a concussion that I had and how our thought process is and perception can alter um, if you suffer a concussion. And um, it just makes you question um, reality and time. So um, I thought uh, as well, it would be like cathartic to kind of think through that process of being, um, you know, um, in this different mind state and using comics to kind of get through that rough period of time. So uh, next slide, please, Gareth. So uh, I was a part of the Colossus Press uh, cartography series, along with my fellow panelists here. <laughs> we all contributed. Um, yeah, it's an anthology that works within the Turkish map fold. And my take on it was uh, stoicism and visualizing the pros and cons of the philosophy, as well as the trends of self-help and adopting new habits and lifestyles. Uh, next slide, please, Gareth. So um, for my Royal College of Art graduate project, um, it, I created a physical embodiment of the abstract in surreal through moving image and experience design. So it was based on um, my psychogeographic connections to Cumbria through hiking and my memories of childhood that it evoked. And I made Kendall Mistake sculptures, uh, stone circle and fell sheet tributes in order to create this physical world that you could experience. Um, so the installation was also shortlisted for the World Illustration Awards in 2019. And now to my last slide. <laughs> mint. <laughs> yes, definitely Mint. Um, my most recent zine, uh, Systems, um, is a condensed um, explorer sketchbook of sorts um, that is based on botany, environmental landscapes, and themes of wanderlust. Uh, so this, this scene documents observations of the weird and wonderful, and it's still available. So uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I'm very short and sweet uh, <laughs> in my approach, but um, yeah, thank you for listening to me. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Lydia. Uh, right, next is me. Um, I'm going to have to train myself at wincing every time I come onto these green screens because there's some more of them. Um, so hello, I'm Gareth A. Hopkins. Uh, not to be confused with uh, Gareth Hopkins, a cricket player or the DJ. Um, so uh, my slides just sort of cover sort of the chronology of my work and how I've sort of developed over the years. Um, so the Intercostal is one of my main projects and has been, and I started that um, by accident in about 2017 or 2018. Um, no, 2008, or 2009. It's been a really long time. So uh, if you look at the the different pages on screen at the moment. The one on the far left is like the first or second page I ever did. Um, and uh, it's because I was drawing in that sort of like really detailed style for, for a long time and then accidentally started putting it in panels and started a comic that way. Um, and then over, I sort of arbitrarily decided that I would do 96 of those um, and then just publish a graphic novel that everyone would buy and would be really famous off the back of that. Uh, obviously, I got I actually made like 100 pages of it and then never did anything with them. Um, but moving on from that, uh, what I started doing was um, coming up with new panel layouts and new things to draw was becoming difficult. So what I started doing was going back to older comics, which I personally loved and sort of investigating those through drawing. So the middle panel is from a comic called Intercostal 683, where I redrew the entirety of my first copy of 2000 AD um, in an abstract style. Uh, and then I changed the style of 
of the comic for each story in that. Um, so, um, and so I did that for a few years and sort of like got a name for myself as being the person who redrew comics, which I sort of got a bit comfortable with. Um, and then the last uh, page here is from uh, the Intercostal 2, which is where instead of focusing on one comic, I, I did different styles. I think uh, that is a Spider-Man page, which I redrew. Um, then um, off the back of 683 and sort of like the promotion of that, I was asked by a publisher to work with uh, Eric Blagsford, who's a poet in the US, um, to come up with a graphic novel. Um, and I was sort of set, I was just told to do 250 comic pages and then uh, Eric would write to them. Uh, and doing 250 pages, and I was given like three months to do it. And after the first month, I was like, here's 50 comic pages, it's taking ages. He's like, and the publisher said they're too comic y. Can you like add in some negative space, give Eric some room to exist in the comic? So what I started doing was um, I took those 50 pages and started drawing over the top of them and using loads of white out, um, chopping them up in Photoshop, which I didn't really know how to use, but I, I did my best. And um, over so, and then quickly built up this process of constantly working on 10 pages at a time, scanning them in, editing them in Photoshop, printing them back out. And so in about, in two months, I managed to generate 250 pages. Eric gave me this big word document block of text and then I cut that up to put through the comic through the through the comic uh, it's fan for us was a weird one because um I always refer to it as a graphic novel and not a comic which winds some people up but it's because it doesn't really work like a comic it works more like a novel which has pictures instead of words um and it's very abstract and really influenced by sort of noise music which I just sort of started listening to at the time um, uh, next is Petricor. So after I'd done Found Forest Floor, um, I didn't really have anything to work from, but I, I liked the, um, the process I'd built for myself. And so I made a little promotional zine for Found Forest Floor, which was 16 pages long, and then drew over the top of that once. And then I drew over the top of what I'd drawn over again and again and again, until I had five separate little comics and I put those all together um, and they were wordless and um, I didn't know what to do with them and then um, a friend and then I thought right these need some words in them so I'll start writing and I started writing very sort of like fragmented stuff it was a bit spooky a bit creepy um, uh, but then while I was sort of writing that um, a friend of mine died and so the experience came about sort of writing through grief which I hadn't experienced before so the comic came sort of became that like a uh, sort of a uh, not really an exploration of just a record like Peony said a record of what I was going through at the time that's what Petrifil was um, and a good comics put that out in 2019 and then we're on to the next two slides are all about explosive sweet freezer razors, which is my current project. Um, and one thing I've realized I hate doing is repeating myself. So if I've done something, I don't like the idea of having to do it again. Uh, and so explosive sweet freezer razors became, uh, I wanted to make a book of short stories, which all, were all in different styles. Um, the first of those is Hill to Cry Home, which is on the right hand side there, which I did. I did that and another one called Petal Burn for the first Hackney Zine Fest. And then um, I've sort of been working up different, different stories and things as I go. And it's, it's still not finished, it's still not shaped. Um, I've got 29 folders of comics that could or couldn't go into it. Um, some of those I might still chop up. So what we've got so far, and um, this also comes back to like me drawing over the top of stuff. So Hill to Cry Home is very much like that old process of drawing over the top of what I'd got before. Um, rotational something, which I haven't finished, is um, it's worksheets about Walton on the Nays, which I found lying around my house. I just painted over the top of those um, without any idea what it was going to be about. So. 
Um, I don't really understand what rotational slump immunity is. It's a job term for erosion. Um, and then uh, the Children of the Valley was, um, I just started drawing while I was watching TV uh, and didn't really think about what I was doing and sort of came up with this sort of landscape comic, like an imaginary landscape comic. And that's all black and white and wordless, um, which is sort of different to what I've been doing. And then I've also got these ones here. So colours is, um, I started working on coloured paper because it felt like a quicker way to fill in the page than colouring it in. That, that's basically how I did that. Um, the Bones of the Sea is, again, something I sort of did by accident by drawing over the top of a bunch of printouts, which came out wrong. Um, and I've included this one because um, I hadn't realised when I published it, I hadn't been paying attention, that my wife had left a note in the middle of the of the comic, which I hadn't seen. So where it says I love Amy, she wrote that for me. I didn't write myself. Um, and then finally, um, Moon Puke is, I think that's the latest thing that came out. Uh, and it's the least comic -y comic I've done so far. So the main body of it was um, some uh, discarded Spirograph pages. Like my daughter tried to use Spirograph, hated it, and then just like had a little thing I put some staples in the middle of it and started drawing over the top of it and then knew that that that's all this mess that I was making in this little booklet was going to be about car parks somehow but didn't know how and then once I finished that I just sort of sat on the shelf for, for ages and didn't know what to do with it and also it's all done with highlighter pens as well so which I don't know if anybody else has ever tried to scan highlighter pen but it looks really rubbish so um, I ended up um, taking photos of the comic and then wrote a story about car parts to go over the top of it so the story and the images don't go together at all other than sort of a rhythm um and yeah that's that's moon puke and that's explosive sweet freezer razors. <laughs> explosive sweet freezer razors apparently a title which i really like written down but can't say out loud um and that's my slides so and finally we've got miranda Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Miranda. I make uh, abstract comics as well, obviously. Um, <laughs> uh, sometimes they have uh, a, a sound element as well. I like to make audio visual comics. Um, you can go to the next to the slide. Um, I think uh, something that we've all kind of said about abstracting comics is like our own, like trying to kind of visually represent like the feeling of memories or like the feelings of experience rather than like the facts of them. I think that's like kind of a way, my conclusion of like abstraction, that's how I got there is like trying to maybe try and like figure things out um, of like how, how to express like the emotions of things rather than the facts or like the written words. So a lot of my comics, they don't have words and I tend to kind of replace elements of a story on, and characteristics with, with shapes and textures. So this is um, Riz de Mar. It's, a, it's an abstract romance between a sphere and a triangulated prism. Um, and this is kind of like supposed to visually represent what it's like to fall in love um and yeah it's got a soundtrack as well so I'm quite interested in because I think music is something that does that really well it it uses abstract things abstract sounds um like out of context to to create emotions like in sequence so I wanted to kind of do that visually so this this has a soundtrack and you listen to the music and you try and kind of like turn the page um, as you go. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, I think all of these have soundtracks as well. This one's got a soundtrack, but this one wasn't intended to have a soundtrack. I just kind of made it and then worked with someone afterwards. Um, this one, uh, I'm also very interested in rhythm as well and how like panels sit next to each other and how that kind of controls the time that you spend on each page, whether it's like whether it slows you down or speeds you up. So in this comic, it starts with like quite big panels and then they get smaller and smaller. 
as you're supposed to become more like panicked or more like stressed by the story. And it's about, um, about following things or like reaching for things that you don't never, you never get to. So it's like, uh, yeah, the feeling of that dis dispat dissatisfa eh. <laughs> dissatisfaction <laughs> of just like constantly chasing after something that you, you never really experience or see. Um, so yeah, that's that one. Next, please. Um, this one was my Colossus. The one on the left is my Colossus cartographies that um, we've all taken part of. That was really fun. Mine was kind of supposed to be um, in theme with the, the map fold. So I was thinking about maps and like what information it kind of lacks and like, what what emotions I could I could add to a map and it was like the feeling of height so this was about like what it is to feel altitude and I asked other people like how how they feel when they fall or when they get too high or that like nervous energy and that was like me visually representing that one on the left um and the other one the one on the right I guess like it can be a lot of things. Every time, every person I've showed that one to, it's it's interpreted in a lot of different ways. And that's that's another thing that I really love about abstraction in comics is that it kind of says says more about the reader than it does the creator because it can be interpreted in so many different ways. Or well, my my comics can. Um, next page, please. Uh, so I also like to use a lot of like fluid imagery and textures. And I think that that goes well with sound as well. So this is, this has like a quite like mellow piano soundtrack um, in collaboration with a musician. Uh, it's very sad and kind of slow. And I think, I think, yeah, like with, with abstract shapes and sound, the, what I find it quite interesting is the way that like sound looks. It's quite fluid, like the, the image of, of a sound wave and, and that kind of like rhythm and kind of like trying to be inspired by that and bring that into some of my comics. Um, so that's an example of that. Uh, last one, please. Uh, so this one is like a really, very abstract concept it's just it's just one long strip um and it's it's I mean it's I did draw it from left to right but it looks cooler and works better from top to bottom so I flipped it and now it's just like one long strip um and that's like it's it's made to inspire a piece of music to inspire an EP so it comes with like a whole album, but it, I created this uh, and then my collaborator, DJ Medal, he, um, he made a piece of music that kind of responds to the shapes and kind of interprets the, how he felt it made him feel. Um, so it's not, it's not like a direct um, piece of music like the first one where you where you actually turn the page and it kind of correlates it perfectly. This is more kind of abstract in the way that it relates to the music as well. Um, yeah, that's that's out on the 24th of September. <laughs> okay, that's my last slide. Okay, right, right. I've got the word chat on screen. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can, I'll have sight by the end of this presentation. Um, so hopefully we just see faces now. Um, if you can't see faces, uh, I'm really sorry. Um, so yeah, that was that was really interesting. So as I was trying to take notes, I was listening to you all and then getting distracted by the screen. Um, so um, what I've, because um, sort of, I sort of like, invited everyone to come to this. Um, because I thought there was similarities between our work, but we, they all look really different. And so listening to everybody talk is really fascinating how similar, thing, similar themes in all of our works was 
were coming out even though we approached them differently. Um, so uh, one thing, I hadn't realised that both Olivia and Beanie went to RCA as well. Did you go there as well, Miranda? No, I went to LCC, <laughs> represent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so there was a few things. One, one of the things that I noticed was um, when Peony was talking about was about using the comic to capture a moment in time. That's uh, similar to Olivia's work, your um, comic about the um, um, the, con the concussion. I can't remember the name. I'm so sorry. The late Sunday. Yeah, and also some of your previous work, um, and I can't remember the name of that either. But the sort of computer gaming one, the breaks. Is that what it's called? No, muscle memory. Muscle memory. Oh yeah, that that's an oldie. Yeah, that one. Yeah, but that felt like capturing a moment of time as well, and like a capsule of it, and taking the sort of the linearity out of the time. Um, uh, and I found that really interesting. So, um, what what do you think it is that's important about removing that linearity from comics? Is that a difficult question? I've just thought of it. I think um, when things are too linear, it restricts not only the artist, but the reader as well. And uh, from my perspective, I think it's still important to still have parameters for it. So like my palettes, I usually stick to one palette for each comic. So it kind of contains the madness. <laughs> so everything else can be jumping around, but I feel like if, one thing is consistent throughout, then it works. So that's my approach to it. Yeah, what you said at the beginning, that was so beautiful. And that really sums up like uh, what is so important for me as well about like having comics that are both incredibly specific, but also so in a way like so, well, open. Yeah, I was gonna say generalized, but it's not generalized, it's open um, because I think it is so important to allow space for a reader to like step into a work themselves. Because if you, it's like that, yeah, because you know, there's certain things in life that everybody can relate to, but also it, you need to make it specific enough that it is uh, interesting and unique and doesn't seem kind of too cliche or too trite, but you need to leave space or it becomes like, it shuts people out a bit. So I think that's why it's a really fine balance to walk. Um, and also on like a, I don't know, and almost like a, again, talking about that relationship between uh, reader and creator, um, I find it really, like I love hearing about how people interpret my work. Like I kind of, I really, really value when people see themselves in something or say oh this reminds me of something or I think that this is about this and for me I never even like never even intended that you know it was a complete mistake but I love it by leaving it open it people can bring more of themselves to it and I think that's really special and like Peony you're kind of like interested in the poetry aspect as well and I think that's like you know in like a purely literature sense that you know it allows the space you know words here and there and like with us images here and there it allows that space and that pause for people mm, yeah. to then reflect and have their own time to kind of decipher what they're seeing yeah so in terms of like text based um using like abstraction what something that i'm able to do because i make abstract comics and i've seen it in peony's work and yours as well Olivia, is that you don't you're not restricted by the panel as to where you put your caption so you can sort of lead people with captions obviously in like traditional comics that's done anyway it's part of like the letterer's like job to lead the reader um but you can sort of break that relationship up a little bit um for effect like when i was doing found forest well, it's the first time i lettered in anything but i was just like really aware of like making sure that on some pages like if you left loads of space, it sort of like opened the reading experience and then I'd intentionally shut it again uh, by like filling up the page with text, um, uh, which I don't know, may have been a mistake making like, like the reader's life difficult for them. But um, yeah, it's just something that I find really um, like freeing about using abstraction, mm. like breaking those rules. Yeah, and I think text is also really interesting because you can't, there's that, you know, there's that fact that people always throw around about how like the average comics 
each panel in a comic people will look at for like 0.3 seconds or whatever. And so by using text, you can control the amount of time that people spend on a page in a way that you kind of can't with an image because people can glance at an image, even if it's incredibly intricate, but with text, obviously, I mean, as, as long as somebody's reading the words, but by playing with it and making the words, you know, loop around and make it physically harder to read, you're making people spend longer on a page. And I think that's quite a, again, like an interesting thing to play with. But I think that's why I also respect like Miranda, like how you um, fully, yeah, just invest in wordlessness. Cause I think I really rely on words as like a tool to be like, well, I want people to know this, or I want people to do this. And so I think letting myself completely let go of that, I'd find quite hard. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it is, it is a little bit hard, but if, if you make it like intriguing enough for someone to really want to figure out like what the hell's going on, then mm. I, think, I think you kind of like get people's attention in the same way. Because Miranda, you mentioned about using um, panel sizes and like uh, gutters and stuff to to slow the reading process down. Um, and one of the things I find really like re uh, interesting about making abstract comics is that um, you make that. Um, so when you when someone makes an abstract comic, they make that more obvious to the person reading it. So I think uh, in traditional comics, like that happens anyway, um, like big panels can slow you down and small ones speed you up. But by taking away sort of the uh, figurative aspects, you make that bit of the process clearer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, and no, is that something that, that you spend a lot of time thinking about when you create? Yeah, definitely. Like if I'm, sometimes I just like try and mess with like one, one part, one format. Of com like one characteristic of, of comics, whether it's like the the level of detail, I'm I'm quite interested in time and rhythm and how like you control that and what it does for the reader and and for you as well and how that kind of how that messes with the experience of it. Um, so yeah, sometimes I I literally just do like all panels, and I just try and like make everything else really simple and just focus on what I'm doing with the panels mm. do, you, do you do the same thing um I have done in the past and like found for a thought I spent a lot of time worrying about that what I've sort of reverted to now is that because the images that I use are so abstract and sometimes I don't know what I'm going to I sort of rely on mistakes now so I like splash a little paint around and like look it about in a pen and I don't I draw with intention but not with a goal um, and so I like to keep the panel layouts really simple. So I'll stick to like a nine page grid or a four, uh, nine panel grid, four panel grid, and keep it like really traditional. Um, Cause it means that I can mess about more inside each of those panels. Um, uh, yeah, cause Olivia, your pages are really structured as well. Like really heavy, like, I don't wanna say rigidly structured, but like very intentionally structured. Yeah, uh, um, in like a similar way that I mentioned about like the the color palette, like some consistency and some structure to enable what is inside to be whatever. <laughs> because yeah. like as well, you know, it can get you can get on tangents and it can get out of hand. But I think sometimes that can work if you want to do a zine. Like my most recent one is a lot more of like a pure organic sketchbook type of thing which is more of like the actual, how I actually process a comic, my usual ones. So it, it all looks like that. And then I structure it. And then I think about the color palette and then I think it's good to go in that respect. Mm. Um, so in terms of color palettes, um, I sort of, as I said, mess about with paint and I'm really traditional. I don't do any, I, I'm too much of a Luddite to do anything digitally. How much digitalization do the rest of you use? Like, do you work with traditional tools or digital? I don't know, whoever wants to speak that. first can speak. <laughs> <laughs> okay, P&E. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll start. <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm like a funny mix in that um, I, like, 
I, I, last year I got myself an iPad and so I have Procreate now and um, I've always been terrible at Photoshop and have all, uh, I'm always made fun of by my friends at uni for being very bad at it but it's been really good for me because I do love that it is actual drawing which even with like a tablet I just kind of couldn't get to grips with but um, the act of like traditional or you know traditional like analog drawing is really important to me just because I think, uh, yeah, I love drawing really quickly and I draw lots of things over and over and over again. And then I'll kind of scan them into Photoshop and then collate them all together and then color in Procreate. And that's kind of become like pretty much the way that I make everything now. Um, and even though, and it's funny because I'm aware that like I could cut out a lot of the middleman just by drawing entirely on Procreate. But for me, there is something really important about the process of drawing physically on paper just because um it's something about those mistakes and also not being able to like control z it away is really important and i think there's just something about like a quality of line that i just that i could at least can't capture um like did completely digitally from the beginning um yeah and i think and um, but then for me the digital process is also really important because it's kind of an extension of the uh what's the word like the organicness of the drawing um mm -hmm. i think because i normally don't i don't really plan like i'll just draw a load of stuff and be like oh i know i really want to explore this idea i know i really want trees and i want nature imagery or like i'm thinking about this room in my grandma's house so i'm going to draw all these things from my grandma's house so i'll do that get all the drawings done put them into photoshop and then that becomes part of the the process of like moving things around and seeing how they fit and um yeah and it, and so that is almost part of the uh yeah it's it's less working to a thumbnail that I already have and it's more seeing like the flow and the rhythm that I can create on the computer so yeah so they're both quite important to me um in that I think that if I drew entirely to, uh, just on paper I think that would like restrict it a bit too much for me but then mm. also entirely yeah digitally doesn't work either for me mm. and Miranda how about you how do you go about things yeah, I, I draw traditionally with like pen and ink um, and then I scan it in and colour it digitally. But I do, I, do, um, I do do some stuff like entire paintings or entirely just traditional, but I could never do something fully digital. I don't like that. But I, I think I need kind of like, because I just draw with like this insane amount of like detail, I need to be able to see... I don't know, ink coming out of a pen for some reason. <laughs> that, like that fluidity just kind of like keeps me going. It feels like really natural and I kind of need that. I also like the idea that I've got like stacks and stacks of like drawings that one day someone's going to find. I'm like <laughs> dead. I don't know. <laughs> I've got the same thing. I've got binders for the paintings that nobody's ever going to want to look at. Um, <laughs> no, no, wait. That no one's going to look at mine. I'm <laughs> Yeah, but I'm the, same, I'm the same in terms of that. And Olivia, how about your? Are you yeah. the same? Like combination? Yeah, yeah, I'm the same. So I really like for digital stuff, it's usually just colour. And sometimes mm. it's inking, depending how I feel. Like, I, uh, I think like you mentioned in your talk, um, how you don't like doing things the same. Like, I kind of want each comic to be a little bit different at least. So I might alter the approaches just slightly, but usually it's a 50-50 split between, because you can't really avoid digital stuff, especially in this day and age. And in like the reality of like commissions and tight deadlines, it can be a lifesaver, especially if you're, you know, you, you just, you know, you need the, you know, control Z. <laughs> <laughs> you just need it sometimes. So it's like, unfortunately, you can't always just be in a fine art kind of I idyllic state you know commercial aspects are there and I think the digital part of that really feeds into that yeah that's really interesting about the commercial side of it because um <laughs> I never think that about selling something to somebody when I make it which probably might go some way to explaining how much I sell <laughs> <laughs> So uh, everything about making the comic, I mean, um, everything about making the comic is like to fulfill some sort of urge I have at that time to do something. Um, and you mentioned about Control Z, and because I work like quite messily now, the closest thing to Control Z is like white ink, and that always goes terribly wrong as well. 
so yeah, I'm con- to, yeah. yeah but I'm constantly building on my own mistakes but in terms of what I have learned to do the hard way is to think about preparing for print as I'm making stuff and I was wondering so in terms of like I'll make sure that when I'm working or try and make sure that I've got plenty of room to crop out from edges and stuff which I didn't do when I was starting I draw all the way up to the edge and make my life difficult and then as I mentioned about I went for years I was using highlighters a lot because they look great and they just go down really easily but you can't digitize them um, because they fade out so quickly Um, and so my process has sort of been driven by that and I was wondering how much that is part of your processes as well. So thinking about um, um, print and how yeah. Be, yeah, I think like when I was starting out in comics, a lot of it was just like not really thinking about that until you got to the print layout, you got to bleeds and borders and you were like, oh no. <laughs> so yeah. you have to think about that. Um, you know, it's not the most um, glamorous side of creating the artwork, but it's really necessary to like yeah. think about how it would look like in print. So. Mm. Well, I suppose it does like colouring digitally helps that because uh, <laughs> I always trick myself because I'll, I've made something which I'm really happy with, scan it and then convert it to CMYK and suddenly it's like a much more boring picture. So I suppose colouring digitally sort of avoid that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Mm, there's nothing more painful than like doing something that like looks amazing in the flesh, but it just doesn't quite translate. It's the worst, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Sometimes but, um, you would like to have like an original thing, <laughs> mm. like you know, or people just to flick through stuff because you've got that Gareth, right? You have a folder that you show at table tabling yeah. events. That make people look at yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great. Like yeah. I just. Think, you know it gives like more life to people's work especially if it doesn't translate as nicely in print or you know when it's digitized so yeah I like that idea like I'm actually I'm so jealous of that because like none of my comics exist as like a like a a physical original because I do the scanning in thing and I always kind of like yeah kind of regret that it doesn't mean that I don't have that big stack of papers (laughs) makes that one comic it means that it just kind of exists in a bit of like the atmosphere and especially because I'm quite bad for um instead of actually thinking about making them for print I'm really bad at being like oh well I want to put this on Instagram so I better think about how I'm going to make it like a readable text on a phone a square format and personally like I mean yeah there's something funny about like the square <laughs> format is great in some senses but it's not that good for like a leading the eye in like a print format book because it's quite it's so restrictive you don't have like the flow of a double page spread as much yeah, um, if you have like your full comic page and mm. then you it into a square like well which panel would be great to show like a preview of my comic and it's like it's quite difficult actually how social media restricts comics in that sense yeah and it's definitely and- like influenced the way that I make in a way that I'm very aware of don't necessarily think that it's a really good thing or a really bad thing it's just a thing that is um especially because I'll often make like little one-off things that just exist on the the internet and they don't exist anywhere else but Hmm. it is it is interesting well because that yeah that's interesting like reflecting Miranda's like massive scroll comic Hmm. because that's like yeah, it's that that is really difficult. Anti social media to make to make look good on anything. <laughs> I really love that. It's like resisting resisting yeah. that and fully being in the physical. I have, I have to just show best. it at loads of different angles to fill the page. It's the only way it works. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, so actually, because Miranda, you were saying that like obviously they go with music. Do you have mm-hmm. like a ideal? setting for them like are they almost intended for like a gallery space where you'd like sit and read them whilst music is played or is it like a personal thing where somebody buys the music and the object to kind of in- ingest in their own space I, I guess a bit of both like I don't really know what people do with them once they've bought them but um, like I really love I've taken I've taken um because I've got I've, some of them have like a the first one I do have a record that's been pressed mm. and um, I did I did um, LCAF and we took record player and played the record and had the comic and you kind of listened to it and that was like really an amazing experience to see people like just get immersed in it and just being forced to just sit 
through that like two and a half minutes and have to pay attention to it and then just like kind of have that experience in in a crowded room so I really like that and maybe yeah maybe they would just be best for the gallery maybe I, maybe I make fine art comics I don't know <laughs> yeah. I just funny. think it's a really interesting solution to like people like trying to walk past your table without stopping <laughs> yeah. like make them wear headphones for two and a half minutes and they're stuck aren't they yeah um yeah because I want to come back to something about uh sound and you so uh Miranda especially in your work I, you're sort of visualizing sound a lot and as you're as we're going through the slides I could sort of hear them um like for, for the um the blue one um I've written down vaporwave I don't actually mean vaporwave but like sort of that sort of like really delicate um nostalgic sort of tone music mm. um how do you go about trying to visualize sound and is that something you try to do or is it something that um it does depend like i i um sometimes i mean a lot of the time it does just come naturally and and it's kind of more about like the highs and the lows and like the like just kind of taking notes on on the progression of the emotions of the song and then like translating that but then i have tried it where i've literally tried to draw the sound as like a, a score like an actual graphic hmm. version of a musical score um which is also cool but it only works with very like simple music and obviously there is already visual like that there, there is already cheap music that already exists so it is kind hmm. of like more of like a just like an expanded version of that with like some colors and some more squiggly shapes yeah, but unless you can read music, then new notation isn't a visualization of music, is it? Whereas I think your comics are, um, in a way that's really interesting. Well, I mean, I do try to, but it's still it's still only like my visualization. Yeah. Of music. Because well, I, yeah, I when I did Found Forest Floor, I sort of there was an album I was listening to um, by Sue Tissue, and the first time I heard it. It did this weird thing to the back, the back of my brain, sort of like tickled like my brain in a way that I hadn't experienced before. And so when I made that book, I was trying to sort of replicate that feeling. Um, okay. And and sort of chasing that. And then for other comics, like when I made Petal Burn, um, I knew that I wanted it to be sort of a nostalgic. Uh, I knew that I want to have a certain atmosphere that I couldn't create without listening to a certain type of music. So mm -hmm. I sat for like a few hours, sort of digested Leaf Library for a little while. And then I was like, right, I've got the mood now. I can sort of put this, I can put this comic together. Um, yeah. So is that? Yeah, um, I think I think that definitely like is maybe how I started being interested in the connection between comics and music, um, as well as like psychedelic rock posters being made by um, point book artists. But like, yeah, just sometimes when I would be reading a comic I would be like I need to I need to listen to something and then and then if I'd be making a comic I'd be like that I need to get angry because I'm making something angry and I listen to angry music and then it just kind of like it all just comes together so, somehow yeah. it's almost like yeah you've just created this mood in your brain and then you can suddenly visualize it well I can't anyways <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah that makes sense how about Olivia and Penny do you is that something that you worry about like the sort of tonal value of the image is that something you're aware of in your work or the emotional kind of the emotional yeah i guess so the emotional or the i, th I think i was thinking about or like an audio quality but i mean as i as i mentioned like the audio quality that i was thinking of feeds into that emotional quality so i guess it's the same question mm. I think during the process, it is like um, similar to Miranda in the sense of like, um, if, if there is a part where I'm referencing some kind of um, negative emotion, I might be more inclined to listen to negative music to get the most out of that piece or that panel or the page. But then once it's all said and done, I don't really look back on it and think, oh, I wonder if the reader will uh, pick up on that or not. 
it's just mm. been a part of the process for me rather than like a purely intentional thing like mm. oh I want this feeling I want this tone I want this emotion it's just how it happens on the page and yeah I don't think about it then again so I don't know <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I think, yeah, because I think for me, I've never really thought about like music isn't really something that makes its way into my work. But I think I always have this kind of like pure abstract idea of, yeah, that kind of like tonal emotion that you were talking about, I guess. Like, I definitely, definitely have that. Um, and yeah, and every and then everything is kind of like trying to tap its way into that pure feeling that is at the center and that it like very rarely ever happens but it is almost like the comic is like patching its way into the center of that thing um and as in yeah and quite a lot of my comics will kind of like bring references from lots of different things to almost like try and attempt that if that makes sense like um mm. like actually the piece I made for Inkwell the um and the brief set by Joe was um and Nora it was basically to kind of it was thinking about thinking about lockdown thinking about mental health thinking about creativity and so it was like all these different ideas and obviously like I think a lot you know everybody had a there was a very specific journey a very specific relationship with those three things during lockdown and um so I had in my head like this pure idea of like yes I want to try and encapsulate that and it's obviously like quite layered and so basically the text that I brought in and the images were all different references to all those different things and then I was trying to bring them together to capture some of that like pure thing in the center um Mm. and yeah and actually although thinking about it sometimes they do almost bring in music. Like in fact, in that piece that I made, there was a line from a Joanna Newsom song um, because more than ever I could, what there was one line in one of her songs um, and also the feeling of that song itself had captured that idea of, um, oh, now I can't remember the line, but it it had like captured basically what I wanted to do beautifully. So I just put it in the comic and quoted it and then gone off on a little tangent and yeah yeah I'm not sure if that really helps that was a bit of a ramble but no it, I I get that. so sometimes when I'm when I'm writing myself I don't, I don't know what anybody else's process is but I will have an idea of what I want to write and I'll start emailing myself as ideas come so it, mm. I find it really difficult to sit down and like type out a script and so I'll type I'll send myself emails until I think I've got enough sit down realize I've got nowhere near enough because lots of emails is actually not a lot of text mm. um but so as I start putting it in, like um, like you said about putting in someone else, like if a lyric is playing in my mind while I'm working, then that will go in. So some of my comics, like Extension has a bunch of lyrics that aren't mine. I, they were just, but they were stuck in my head and I just had to like plot them out. Yeah, I do the same thing because I think it is, you're bringing in, you know, it's that, again, that thing of like, nobody exists by themselves. Like you're just a amalgamation of everything that happens around you and that you experience. So it feels yeah. almost like, cause sometimes in the past I've been almost like, oh, well I shouldn't use references to other stuff or like, it feels like stealing, but it's not because it's, yeah, you're build, you're creating like a little body of work or it's like a, a microcosm of the way that you're affected by all these different influences in life. And then you're all these different influences work those way into quite a specific, comic page yeah yeah absolutely like um coming back to the grid site every time i use a nine panel grid it's it's like practically a reference to watchman like it's impossible to not yeah completely yeah see that as I'm putting it in. so although like i'm trying to create stuff which hasn't been done before like actually like putting that into the process like if it looks familiar take it away i still make sure that it's still referencing back to stuff um and explosive sweet freezer raises as a collection that's part of the process or there's lots of little elements although they're different that feed into each other um so but while we've all been talking about this we i think what we've all said is that we're like trying to find something really specific through process like and one thing that i noticed between all of us is that we don't collaborate with other people very often and so I was wondering if that's part of it so Miranda you work with musicians and I worked with Eric and that was really successful but I find it really difficult to express what I want to via somebody else is that intentional on your part or is it just something that's happened 
for me it is entirely intentional um yeah because in fact when you were doing your presentation I wrote down about that project because I was going to be like how did you feel working with somebody else's words but your drawings because I think I'm just I'm too selfish and I can't <laughs> do that because or I don't know I think maybe if I had like the perfect project but for me I need like I need both I need like the words and the images and then they create the thing that is me and also I think because my work is very much it's self-centered it's about myself it's about my own experiences so I think maybe you know if I was making like a non in a world where I make a non-fiction graphic novel about something fit you know very important but, I, I don't know when I have to work with like a you know some a historian or something then obviously then that would be that would be a very different thing but in terms of like my personal practice for lack of a better word like a thing that builds on something that I'm making for myself I don't think I could do it but that's just me uh, Olivia yeah. you sort of like laughed and nodded up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I agree but the funny thing is at the moment I am like working with a writer and I've really enjoyed it and I never thought I would I thought it would be so precious about my ideas and how it would translate and how everything would look but sometimes it's good to be out of your comfort zone because you might surprise yourself because <laughs> oh, I know you make me doubt myself <laughs> no 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 I just say like you might like create like you might be like oh this is the best work I've ever done and it's through working with someone else and you wouldn't have I never thought you know um yeah but I'm totally the same I, I that is still me to my core but it's quite interesting like I think even if you didn't have a great experience working with someone just knowing I don't know how I guess because we we're inspired by other people like music other art and working with something actively on something new is quite it's it's quite a nice experience so yeah I, I'm more open to it now <laughs> now <laughs> now I'm I, in the process of doing it I can I recommend it because you never know what might happen. <laughs> That's a solid pitch. I'll take, I'm not, not going to do it tomorrow, but I'll take it on board. <laughs> because honestly, I was like so much like, I'm just going to do everything myself. And now I'm thinking, hmm, like working with other ideas and seeing how I can still have my own stamp on that is mm -hmm. quite cool. Out of interest, is it as in, did they have a script and then, or is it more collaborative? Like, um, going yeah, like um, they have, they, 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 I guess they had this basis of an idea and I was allowed to input on the script as well. Like, you know, like a uh, Word document, Google Docs. Mm -hmm. oh, what about this? What about that? Oh, that would be cool. And oh, uh, that's good. I could do yeah, that. So it's like a purely collaborative thing, not like the conventional comic thing where it's like the writer's like, this is my baby and mm. you have to make it look <laughs> how I want this is a much more like how I think collaboration should be you know so yeah yeah no I I agree I'm I'm, I'm actually really all for collaboration I, I love it in in many parts of things like I it, it does depend though because like <laughs> I I mean if I've got an idea I probably don't want someone else to mess with it but if I don't have an idea or if I have like a vague concept, like I, I, I have a street art crew, there's three of us and we oh. fully collaborate. <laughs> That's really fun. That's Sorry, oh, hands hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I also have been collaborating with uh, a knitwear designer as well to make a knit comic. That's Whoa. Oh, that sounds um, amazing. Like a massive tapestry. It's going to be really cool. Uh, and yeah and I've collaborated with writers as well and I, I that's yeah it's one of my favorite things to do but like on a practical level you're not always going to be available all the time to collaborate so mm -hmm. like and I have loads of ideas on my own so I end up just like finishing all that stuff and then the collaboration stuff kind of takes a little bit longer it's a bit of a slower it's like a different it's like a whole different thing I think it's also very important and it inspires you for your own personal stuff yeah. oh yeah that said I've actually just remembered that I have done like collaborations where it's like you make a bit of work and then you like bounce off each other and then mm. but I think for me it's more like I need to be in control of like the words and the image but I enjoy like making things in response but it's like those two little things for me like I couldn't take somebody else's 
words I guess but no but completely right like so much beauty can come from like bouncing off of somebody else's process as well so do you feel that your um your words are more precious to you than your drawings or are they both like you know I th- yeah I think they do like they're both I think they're both equally important but in like really really different ways because I, I think my, it's yeah I think the the words are really precious because they are like a diary um, yeah, and because absolutely. I think and also because they tend to be very like as in they are literally from like my sketchbook so they tend to be like they basically are diary thoughts I think um but in the drawings I think in their ambiguity I'm more comfortable with people pulling them apart a bit more yeah. um so but they're but I also could never like publish a book that was like just words. I think that would be rubbish. (laughs) I think they really, they need each other. Definitely. Um, I just think, uh, but I think also I've I've talked about this when I've done like other talks and stuff in that, like as an illustrator, I found it really hard to justify the words for a long time. And I felt like I wasn't allowed to do them because like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not a writer. I'm an illustrator. I've got a degree (laughs) in it. I can point to that. Um, And so yeah that was quite like a journey so I think maybe that's why I can see more precious about the words because I'm more insecure about them but they are both as important as each other yeah I agree I, there's a certain uh, vulnerability to mm. writing that I don't get when I'm drawing yes like, I feel like I can hide behind my drawings but mm. when I put my words down I'm like oh <laughs> yeah yeah that evokes a kind of yeah I, I, I think, get that totally yeah because I think also writing is like everybody everybody writes and everybody can critique a piece of writing but with drawing a lot of people tend to be quite generous and they can you know they tend to be quite like oh they just love that you've done some drawing or they love that it's a visual intro so um, it you know they're kind of happy with it but with writing like literally anybody can critique it in quite a cruel way sometimes I found that's very true Words is yeah. I think that's the, I think that's actually I I like to think that it's very intellectual reason why I don't do words, but it's actually I'm just really scared. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. Um, I as you've been saying about someone, if someone critiqued my use of words, I would be more um, sensitive to it than with my drawing. And it's because I try and use words in such a specific, particular way, and because I use them really sparingly as well. So, like. In a novel, you've got lots of time to explain your point, but working the way I do, you need to get the sense of what you're trying to convey in like two or three sentences or less, because I can never fit words into the caption box without covering up loads of stuff I've drawn. So I'd like naturally reduced my text to let as much of the page remain. Um, and so, yeah, when um, Petrichor came out, that I think people responded to the words, but I think if that is where the, weirdly, that's where the controversy, and not controversy, but people weren't saying nasty things, but the like conversation around the book was from the use of language rather than use of images. Uh, yeah. So um, oh, we've only got 15 minutes left. Um, but one thing, <laughs> this is, we've only got 15 minutes left and I'm going to ask the most difficult possible question <laughs> because it's come up through what Miranda's been saying. Uh, so Miranda's made like a really long scroll comic and she's made a knit comic and we've all <laughs> made things which are comics but not by the normal rules of what a comic is. So what's a comic? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think a comic is uh <laughs> sorry i should have like thought about this yesterday and emailed you I, all time I mean for, for me for me it's just a sequence of images i would i would say any any sequence of images that tells a story that has a narrative is a comic i'm going to say organized chaos oh <laughs> Um, yeah <laughs> no that's a good one uh, yeah I know I, I agree um yeah and I, also I'm also very happy to be like it can be what you want it to be and I don't mind if, <laughs> yeah. if whatever because yeah I think um some people do get very hung up on the definitions and I think I've uh, I'm very happy to let them go because in fact I think 
yeah there's because I think also when I started making comics I didn't even really think about them being comics till somebody else started calling them that and I was like yeah mm. that's great go you know let's go with that um yeah that's a terrible answer well because I my the work, the work definition I've come up with because I've spent the past 10 years or so worrying about it and it often comes up in reviews like what is is this a comic um and but I always go back to the is if if the intention was to make it a comic then it's a comic regardless of what it yeah. looks like and how it works mm. if the intention's there because um you like you often see adverts which use if you're just like and they've got bo- lots of boxes with lots of faces in or lots of things happening in them but the intention of those boxes was to illustrate lots of different things but there wasn't a comic um and same as like um like brochures and stuff like in my sort of daily work I used to get lots of promotional brochures which if you could recreate them as comics and I have done like draw, drawing over the top of them to make them comics but it's that sort of intention as long as, it's, as the intention was there to make it a comic then it's a comic and it's the same with your knitted comic like I think and to me that's the definition of what makes a comic uh, and that's why um, with Found Forest Floor we and this is going to really annoy lots of people in the chat i can hear simon russell shouting already um is that i didn't i set out to make a graphic novel and not a comic it, for the reason i said before and so that's what i found for us what isn't a comic because it's a graphic novel whereas i could make a graphic novel which is also a comic so mm. i don't think i yeah. like the term graphic novel <laughs> i don't you like it I don't. It, it Lots of people it, hate it, yeah. It yeah, I'm not a big serious. fan. It makes it too serious and too... Yeah. I don't like when people are hung up on definitions, like, mm. to the point where it's like, it doesn't matter <laughs> to me. <laughs> like, if you enjoy it, good. If you don't, you don't. Yeah. I, yeah, <laughs> I, well, because like, I, I often really like words which people... So, like, blue sky thinking winds up birds of people but it perfectly describes a particular way of thinking even if it's a wanky way of thinking it's it's still did like you it, it's, it, did you want to wind people up do i want to wind people no, up? no no did you want to <laughs> it, the the thing um the no thing no that's wind. it because i know so the intention wasn't to wind people up but i knew it was going to um <laughs> so. Carried on. anyway that's good yeah um okay so um we're sort of gonna um i've got a slide that says q and a i'm not gonna bother sharing it because we're now in the q and a section so if anybody's <laughs> got any questions um feel f- like directly to us the chat box has been going crazy town and i haven't been able to follow it so um if anybody's got any questions then yeah there's been there's been some great chat going on like with, yeah. with amongst the audience i'm really looking forward to reading that <laughs> chat warfare uh yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's been some really good questions in the chat. Um, I actually, I pulled, I pulled out a couple of them uh, just so we can put them to you guys at the end. Firstly, also, thank you so much for that, that talk. That was fantastic. I think uh, the, the main thing I've seen in the chat is everyone saying how much they've been enjoying it and how good it is. Uh, one of the questions that, that people did ask is, where can they purchase your work? Because you guys didn't really say that. So um, that would probably be a good thing to plug yourselves so people can get their hands on your amazing abstract comics. That's a very good point. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can get my comics on um, osillustration.bigcartel.com. <laughs> I think I actually got the link in the event description of my my, my bio. So yeah, can- that's a good point actually. There are links there. I can I can drop them in the chat um, as well. But yeah, if, if, if you guys have any other particular places um, that you want to highlight that weren't on that thing. Social cool. media tags and whatnot. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'll put those in the chat and I'll send an email to everyone afterwards as well so people can catch up again on those things if you want to. Um, another really in- in- interesting question that I saw, well, there was, there was one that, um, is there a le- level of abstraction when a comic stops being a comic? But I think you guys kind of answered that already by deciding that comics don't exist or something. Uh, <laughs> or uh, comics is just a made-up term, which I, I kind of agree with. Um, there's one, one question I really liked was, uh, since many of you have been to art schools, how do you cite this work in the context of art history? Which is a big question that we've only got nine minutes to answer potentially. (laughs) Uh, I agree. (laughs) 
Um, yeah, I think as, as, that's, that's a really good question in terms of, yeah, how do you think in terms of this comics as an art form, um, especially since with the kind of work that you guys make and how it, it does obviously push the boundaries of what people think of as a comic in the traditional sense. Do you think it does kind of, it has more importance from a kind of the, the cultural artistic point of view, like the high culture kind of thing? Uh, or do you think that because by the nature of them being comics, then it, it's, it's, it's going to be in that kind of part of art history? I think I think it's all it all should be high culture anyways. I think so, someone some random people have decided whether it's high culture or low culture um, just by, I guess, the, the amount of versions available, maybe. I don't know, like whether it's commercialized or not. But yeah, I yeah. think I think it should all be. I mean, I think I think comics is obviously very uh, marginalized as a as a very specific genre. Of, of low art, but I don't think it's, it should be. <laughs> yeah, I think um, because I'm influenced more, although like I make comics and like my sort of peers make comics as well, like traditional comics, um, I'm more influenced by approaches to music. And so some of my comics, I think I have pretensions towards fine art. And I think when Explosive Sweet Free Razors is finished, like, I'd like to present it as like a fine art object. But at the same time, I really like the idea of just like hitting a bin in the garage and that being, and just that activity being as important. And so it's like low art, like me like going in like, I don't know, punching a tree or something as an, no, that's a really bad example. But sort of making a noise for the sake of making noise isn't, I don't necessarily think of it as a fine art process, but it's something just that I enjoy doing and presenting to people. So, yeah, I think I'm not particularly interested in like, I don't particularly, in, yeah, in like, I, I agree, I don't particularly enjoy that idea of there being these two separate art forms that don't coexist because they completely do. But what I do enjoy playing with and talking about is um, the different setting of a work and how you can. Um, really capitalize on a certain element of that. For example, what I really like about installations is that it is time specific and it is experiential. So you're forced to be inside of it for a specific amount of time and it becomes like a, it becomes a specific memory in your mind. Whereas like something about a book that you take home, you know, the beauty of it is that it's something that you can pick up whenever and revisit regularly, but also it becomes a more everyday act. And so therefore it doesn't become as momentous because it's not something that happened in one moment in time. So yeah, um, that's that's why I personally quite enjoy that um, experience of playing with putting this comic real big in a space outside, for example, but then but then I also really don't enjoy the um, the trappings of um, exclusivity that trap people outside of being able to see that, whether, you know, obviously not being able to go see it or, you know, also money if it's like a paid event, that kind of thing. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think that it's, it's an enjoying, it's, yeah, I enjoy playing with the trappings, but I don't particularly uh, like that conversation of saying like, my comic's going to be in this bracket today. <laughs> mm. mm -hmm. I just like the concept that like comics should be for everybody as much as possible and that's what matters the most to me like you know to kids to whoever like can get something out of it I think that's the beauty of comics because it, it you know depending we all spoke about definitions of it and not really thinking there is one but I guess we always have that sort of like innocent purity about it <laughs> like you know we how people immediately think of what comics are and I just think it's like this you know there's this purity to it to creating it and uh you know trying to create it for like you know in book formats for the masses and yeah i i think that's the most important part excellent yeah i mean i personally don't think that there should be a distinction between uh between comics as whether they're higher or lower i probably shouldn't have used those terms because people in the chat did not like that as well oh, crazy but, uh, for it. <laughs> <laughs> I stand by it just in terms of the way of depicting that idea of yeah the, the kind of stuff that exists in the gallery the kind of idea of it's a more expressive form maybe, maybe versus more the narrative form uh but obviously you guys managed to do both um that's not very good uh another, another question from the chat i'm um, actually one from right at the start is uh what's the, what's the like i did i did i did behind I did using a, 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 a type, type typeface over I, the hand writing your uh text in your comics because a, a, lot, a lot of you tend to do that 
Uh, is, is there like a particular thought behind why you guys uh, mm. lean more into that rather than handwriting? Um, I actually, I used to only use handwriting and then kind of transitioned into um, typeface. And uh, it was, yeah, it was something that I feel like I remember not being, uh, I didn't really like uh, analyze at the time, but now looking back, I think it's interesting in that I think uh, a typeface kind of brings a certain distance to the work in that it removes that authorial voice really far. So occasionally, if I ever want to do something really personal again, I'll bring back in that handwritten type because it just brings it back to that, like, oh, the hand has drawn this. It's from me, a person. And you, yeah, when something's written, you can very much visualize that person making it. Whereas when it's font, it's a more like objective speaker. Um, yeah, and I think also I am really interested in how, like I love playing with like different fonts and typefaces and you can completely change again, the voice tone um, of a piece. It's like another tool, which I think is really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas my own handwriting only has that one voice and only has that one tone. So there's less to play with. Uh, yeah, so I'm the same. I use typeface for tone and like in, my current work at the moment I change the typeface for each comic because the tone of that typeface needs to be different um in something like and also um when I made Petricor and found Forest Floor I use the same typeface for those because um they were the typeface that Eric used when he wrote poetry so that's he writes in that typeface he presents in that typeface and as a way of preserving his voice as well and I really like the way that 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 the voice carried through on the typeface and then for something like, um, I did a comic called Nothing, which was um, on the face of it about 66 different people, but the typeface was intentionally like, it was courier so that the typeface looked flatter to sort of flatten out the voice um, and make it, make it seem more artificial. Uh, and that was just like a, a choice. I've, I mean, where I've used, uh, and then, the practical aspect as well, which is that I tend to write as I letter. Uh, and so if as I'm, if as a, a lettering, there's like a space which needs to be filled in with words, I can do that easier as part of the process. Whereas um, writing stuff out, I've got terrible handwriting anyway. Um, and um, I find it easier to edit and write as I go, but not hand writing. Olivia, you use the same typeface every time, don't you? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, a courier based uh, hmm. um, typeface too. Um, more so for like the sort of typewriter effect. I want to, I want to be like a beat poet or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but like, if I do like my own handwriting, like in, I've done it before, um, and it just, it becomes, it's weird. Like, I can't control it. Like, even if it's like I want to make it neat or whatever start getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then like if I ever made that into a book people wouldn't be be able to read it and I, yeah it's more of like a presentation thing like I just don't but yeah when I'm like sketching or whatever it's always handwritten and then I just put it into typeface <laughs> it mind is it, hard. Mind <laughs> it have words so I, I'm gonna dip out of that sidestep it <laughs> smart smart <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, that more or less takes us right up to the end. And also, I forgot the obvious answer to the question of where can people buy your work at the Hackney Comic and Zine Fair, which is happening right now on the internet. If you go to hackneycomicfair.com, I assume everyone in this uh, on this call uh, has already been there. That's how they found out about it. But if you haven't, we've got three halls with up with ninety exhibitors and thirty baby comics. It's very good. Um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone on the panel: Olivia, Miranda, Bini, and Gareth. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, and yeah, catch you again soon. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.